Looking forward now to our first training session of the day with AMA staff to learn about the three health policy issues we are supporting during this conference, why they matter to patients and medical students, and how to advocate for these issues on Capitol Hill. Join us today, we have Brian Hole from the AMA Division of Legislative Council, Jason Marino from AMA Congressional Affairs, and Sandy Marks from AMA Federal Affairs. Throughout the session, you can submit a question in the Submit a Question tab located on the right side of your screens. Brian, Sandy, Jason, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Great. First, uh, we'll have Brian who will lead us on education on Medicare reform. All right, thank you, Brittany, and good morning. It's a pleasure being here today uh, with my colleagues, Sandy Marks and Jason Marino to discuss these very important issues that you as medical students are likely hearing about now or will be hearing about in the near future. I am going to briefly discuss the topic of Medicare reform and provide you with an overview of the issues connected to Medicare payment and how you can help to advocate and communicate effectively this comprehensive Medicare issue. Just to set the stage a little bit, um, and this information may not be new to you, Medicare is a federal health insurance program that serves seniors and people with disabilities. The program helps to pay for a variety of healthcare services, including hospitalizations, physician visits, prescription drugs, et cetera. Before Medicare, less than half of the elderly population had health insurance, and now, as of 2022, more than 63 million people have coverage through the Medicare program, and that's roughly 19% of the U.S. population. But what we're seeing is that Medicare spending is outpacing the number of people paying into the system. And that's now created a funding gap in the program, and we'll discuss the implications of that later on in the presentation. So physician payments under Medicare have been highly debated since the inception of the program, and Congress at various times has been forced to make several key changes over the years. And there have been different formulas used by Congress to pay physicians. Um, at the inception of the program, back in 1965, uh, physician payments were based on the physician's actual charges. In 1975, the Medicare Economic Index was developed as a fixed fee schedule and annual increases were then based on physician operating costs and general earnings. But that system was flawed and annual changes to physician fees had to be determined by congressional action. And we saw that through 1998 when the sustainable growth rate or the SGR was developed in order to link physician reimbursement under Medicare with increases in the economy. Now this formula resulted in payment cuts for physicians and Congress was again forced to pass a series of patches each year to reduce the impact of these cuts. In 2015, the payment system had a major change called the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, or MACRA for short. And under this, the fee schedule, which is a comprehensive listing of fee maximums used to reimburse physicians, um, was uh, adjusted by different categories. And this was done in order to avoid at that time a 21% reduction in payments under the Medicare physician fee schedule. Now, the important aspect of MACRA is that it shifts Medicare from volume to value-based services. And there are certain metrics used to calculate payments under this system, which is defined under statute. But the important takeaway here is that the system is comprehensive, comprehensive and it still remains flawed which can lead to physicians getting their payments cut. Like we almost saw last year when physicians were facing a 9.75% cut in reimbursement. So the current landscape of Medicare payment is that um, we are deeply alarmed about the growing financial instability of Medicare physician payment systems due to a confluence of fiscal uncertainties. Um, because physician practices are facing statutory payment cuts, a lack of Infl inflationary updates and significant administrative barriers like prior authorization, which we'll hear about later on in this presentation. And we are still in an ongoing pandemic. The payment system is on an unsustainable path, threatening patient access to physicians. So this chart here shows how Medicare updates have compared to inflation. And according to data from Medicare, physician pay has increased just 11% over the last two decades or 0.5% per year on average. And in comparison, 
Medicare hospital updates totaled roughly 60% between 2001 and 2021, and Medicare skilled nursing facility updates totaled more than 60% between the same time period. But the cost of running a Medicare a medical practice increased just 39% between 2001 and 2021 with increases in physician office rent, um, employee wages, and professional liability insurance, among others. And as a result, Medicare physician pay is not keeping pace with inflation and practice costs. In fact, Medicare physician pay declined 20% from 2001 to 2021, highlighting the need for reform. The Medicare physician payment system is lacking an adequate annual physician payment update, similar to other Medicare providers illustrated in this chart. This chart simply talks about Medicare spending, and we see that fee schedule spending per enrollee decreased 1% over the last decade, while in comparison, spending per enrollee has increased over the same period for other components of Medicare Part B, excluding physician fee schedule spending, and we see Part A, Part C, and Part D also seeing spending per enrollee increasing over the same amount of time. So given this data, we are left to rely on an act of Congress to fix this threat to Medicare reimbursement. Congress must recognize the need for critical reforms to the Medicare physician fee schedule system, especially um, when it comes to budget neutrality, which can lead to arbitrary reductions to reimbursement that are unrelated to the cost of providing care. And it's urgent that Congress work with the physician community to develop solutions to the systemic problems with the Medicare physician payment system. And at a minimum, we want Congress to establish a stable annual Medicare physician payment update that keeps pace with inflation and practice costs. Physicians should be getting involved through their local and national medical societies, and this is where you can get involved. These groups typically have resources to help educate members of Congress and ask them to take action. Physician groups have helped shape Medicare policy in the past and must continue this level of advocacy to ensure that our patients have access to vital health care services moving forward. And our advocacy team is working hard with Congress, CMS, and members of the Federation and House of Medicine to see what long-term fixes can be put in place. In addition, you can help support uh, the Value and Healthcare Act of 2021, HR 4587. This deals with alternative payment models, which are a form of payment reform that incorporate quality and total cost of care into reimbursement rather than traditional fee-for-service structures. Uh, when Congress passed MACRA back in 2015, it included a 5% bonus to payments to incentivize, incentivize participation in APMs. Unfortunately, to date, uh, the development of APMs has been limited, and the physician community is still committed to work with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to expand the availability of value-based APMs and remove some of the structural barriers to participation. And Congress can help the process by passing this bipartisan value act, which would extend the 5% APM incentive payment program and make further improvements to encourage um, increased physician participation. At this time, I will pass it on to Sandy Marks, who will talk more about telehealth. Thank you very much, Brian. So to um, get started on telehealth, we don't need to go quite as far back as, as Brian did in history, but we do need to go back to before the coronavirus pandemic began. So prior to March of 2020, the Medicare program's coverage of telehealth was extremely limited. It was only available to patients who live in rural areas. And to get telehealth services, patients had to go to a medical facility like a physician's office or a rural hospital. Um, they had to use two-way audio video telecommunications equipment. This would basically be some physician at a distant site communicating with the health professionals at the site where the patient was. And there was a very limited number of services that were on Medicare's telehealth list. In addition, because payments were made at the rates that are paid in facilities, they were about 30% below the payment rates that physicians receive when they provide services in their offices. So it was not very financially sustainable. Now, in January of 2020, the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services declared a nationwide COVID-19 public health emergency. That public health emergency or PHE needs to be 
renewed every 90 days. So most recently it was renewed on January 18th, and that takes us into uh, April. And if it's renewed again, which most people expect to happen, that gets us to about July. It's not clear how much longer it will be renewed after that though. Um, in addition to the secretary having this authority to declare the PHE, Congress passed legislation that said when the PHE is in effect, HHS can waive a number of the previous limitations that existed on Medicare coverage and payment for telehealth services. Now the PHE also affects other federal policies besides telehealth. So the emergency use authorizations that we've seen for vaccines and drugs to treat COVID um, and patients who have Medicaid have been able to remain on their Medicaid coverage without having to have their eligibility redetermined. The PHG made a huge difference in Medicare policy for telehealth coverage. Patients everywhere in the country can now get telehealth services. Um, they can receive telehealth services in their homes or wherever they're located. Physicians can provide telehealth services from their own homes or wherever the physician is located. And in addition to the audiovisual telecommunications equipment that has always been available to be used for telehealth, both patients and physicians can now use smartphones to do telehealth services, and they can even use audio only telephones such as landlines if they don't have access to broadband services. The payment rates were increased for these telehealth services. So now they're the same, whether a patient goes in person to a physician office for a service or receives that service via telehealth. And the Medicare program added about 150 codes to its list of the services that it would pay for when they're provided via telehealth, including telephone visits, emergency department visits, hospital at home services, so patients don't even have to be hospitalized when they need hospital level care in some cases, and many different types of therapy. This graph shows the very dramatic increase in the provision of telehealth services that occurred starting in March 2020 with the um, shutdown due to the pandemic when neither patients nor in many cases physicians could go where they normally would go to receive or provide healthcare services. But I think it's also interesting to look at that stretch between uh, about May or June of 2020 and the end of 2020, because things did not return to the way they had been before. You see that at the tail end on the left side in January and February, telehealth spending under the Medicare payment schedule was almost zero. It was less than 1% of total spending on physician services. But even after people were able to get out some and able to get some in-person services, telehealth remained between four and 6% of Medicare spending. Now, what was being spent on? Um, largely office visits for established patients. So this was also a big change because whereas people may have gotten telehealth services from companies that only provide telehealth before, now they were able to get telehealth services from their regular physicians, people they had an established relationship with before COVID began. Also, a lot of telehealth services were provided for mental health care. And you see there that as Medicare started covering telephone calls, many of those were also provided in 2020. Now, Congress has already enacted legislation that will extend Medicare's payment for telehealth services throughout the country and for patients when they're in their homes, when the, when the services are for the diagnosis or treatment of mental health conditions or substance use disorders. They did apply some conditions to that coverage, however. So in order for Medicare patients being treated for mental health conditions via telehealth, to receive those services, they will have had to have an in-person visit with their physician six months before their first telehealth visit and within 12 months of subsequent telehealth visits. The AMA is supporting legislation and we'd like your help to try to get that in-person requirement removed. 
for other Medicare telehealth services that aren't related to mental health or substance use disorders, we have a serious problem because when the public health emergency ends, it will go back to the way it was before. Telehealth would only be available to patients in rural areas and they could only get those services if they went to a medical facility to receive them. So it would be just a huge step back in time to before anybody was using telehealth um, at all. So we're advocating for passage of legislation that would permanently extend the telehealth access that patients have now, whether or not they're in rural areas or go to a medical facility. We're also advocating with the agency that runs the Medicare program to continue covering audio only telephone visits. So there are multiple federal agencies that are exploring what telehealth policy should look like after this PHE ends. Um, HHS, of course, which, which manages the whole Medicare program as well as many other healthcare services like Medicaid. Um, there are research agencies, federal research agencies, such as the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality that is expected to come out with a big report on telehealth services sometime this spring. There's a Congressional Advisory Commission, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission that's providing recommendations to Congress on telehealth, and the AMA has been involved in doing research on telehealth. We were involved in a, in a major study called Return on Health, which looks at the value of telehealth services and describes a number of case studies involving digitally enabled hybrid care that includes a mix of both in-person and virtual care. And now I'll turn over to my colleague, Jason Marino, who will talk to you about prior authorization. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about prior authorization. And I, I think I'll start with just trying to give you a real world example. Let's say I woke up this morning with a horrible rash all over my face. And so bad that I can't even go to the bus stop with my kids because I'm going to embarrass them. And, and, and I need to get, I need to go see my dermatologist to see how I can fix this rash. And I go to a dermatologist and he or she says, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is there's a treatment for this rash, I can, we can make it go away. And you have Aetna and it's covered. That's the good news, so I'm happy. But there's some bad news in that we have to get what's called prior authorization from Aetna for, for you to actually get coverage for this particular service, right, right, this medication right now. And so just hang tight, hang tight. I know you have a big work of angels to speak, but it's gonna take a little while, hang tight. And essentially that's what prior authorization is where the insurance company uh, even though you're, you have, you're a patient that has a covered benefit, they make sure that yeah, they, they sign off on whether that particular treatment or medication is going to be covered in, in that instance. And, and they do that, they argue, to see they keep healthcare costs and utilization under control. They think that uh, if they don't have that check, this is just going to order a bunch of tests and a bunch of medications and treatments and patients are going to go in the pharmacy and, and, and over-utilize and drive out healthcare costs. And from the AMA, from the physician perspective, for several years now, the AMA has done a survey of physicians on prior authorization. And what they found is this is a real regulatory burden. And for physicians, it's a barrier to access for patients. And we've quantified it in that uh, two business days in a given week are consumed for physicians and their staff just dealing with these, these, these prior authorizations. It, 41 a week on average. Of these for just my, my my example is a benign one. Imagine it's cancer care or diabetes or, or something that's more urgent, and you have to go through all these hoops uh, over and over and over again. And we find that uh, physicians found that eight, eighty percent of physicians reported that a lot of patients just got fed up with the, the delay and they just abandoned treatment altogether just because they got frustrated. Maybe they showed up at the pharmacist and they didn't get the approval yet, and they said, "Sorry, we can't give you your medication," and they just left. They're not going to come back. That's a problem. And one third, this is even more uh, alarming, one third of physicians report that patients have actually had serious adverse outcomes because of this and that they, they ended up being hospitalized because of, during this delay, their condition got worse. They became disabled or a permanent disability or even death uh, while they're waiting. And, and, and why? When, when we get data that show that most of these get approved in the end anyway, so why are we jumping through these hoops? 
And, and we've also had some new data that shows that physicians report that 51% of patients uh, and physicians report that their patients tell them that they, they are lose productivity at work. They can't do their job while they're in this limbo. Um, maybe I couldn't give them this speech. I couldn't be talking right now. If I had a full body rash on my face, I probably I wouldn't probably be talking right now. So it, it can impact you. And so um, what do you do about it? What, what's the solution? And so there's a bill in Congress and the House and Senate, and it's uh, it's um, it's it's sponsored by a Congresswoman. It's in your handout too. There's some handouts that Brittany sent out, and it it um, Congresswoman Delbany and Congressman Mike Kelly from from Pennsylvania, and then in the House and the Senate side, Senator Dr. Marshall and uh, Senator Thune, Senator Brown, others are on a bill that would say in the Medicare Advantage space. So Medicare Advantage is the private plan uh, that's available for um, seniors in Medicare. And it's wildly popular. A lot of the bipartisan people love their Medicare Advantage, the seniors like it. And we're saying, and a lot of times what Medicare Advantage does, it drives a lot of the private insurance market. So you wanna get at that. And in 2018, we, uh, Amy, convened a stakeholder group with, with some of the health plans, pharmacists, hospitals, um, and others, and they came to a consensus on how do we fix this, make prioritization work better. And that led to this bill. And, um, and this bill essentially would streamline the process. So you would have to have an inner review of what is gonna be in prioritization and why is it based on best clinical guidelines um, and, and know what's, what, what they're working from. And then look at that every year, make sure that it's following, it's continuing to follow clinical guidelines. Things like, uh, can, this, can this process be done electronically with real time decision making? Can you have what's called gold card, whereas a thing, if a particular service gets approved over and over again, um, you just, they get a gold card and they can skip the whole process. Um, uh, are there, is there an explanation, it may require explanation, um, why were there a denial? What's the reason? How long did it take between when you said, hold on, we gotta check this out, how long does that take? And why? And why did it take so long? And just have some transparency. I think there was a lot of more, there was more transparency uh, that would lead to better results. So this is a very reasonable bill. Uh, our opponents and the health plans like to say either it's gonna it's gonna undermine Medicare Advantage, which is popular. This is gonna make Medicare Advantage work better. We're not saying get rid of all the prioritization, have no checks at all. We're just saying if you're gonna have some checks on on services that physicians prescribe or the Let's make it reasonable. Let's make it work better. Let's streamline it. And uh, so we are trying to build support. This bill in the House has over 261 co-sponsors, very bipartisan. On the Senate, it's 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 an even nine and nine, 18 co-sponsors, bipartisan. And we're hoping to build support throughout the year. And in, and during a lame duck session of Congress, when the, after the election, usually in November, December, there's there's a Congress reconvenes and they pass some bills. And we're hoping this makes it in the mix. So I uh, encourage you to, to go to the Hill and kind of, if you have anecdotal stories of your own, uh, what this means, talk about that. Because um, this is one of those that you, you don't want to be too abstract because it probably, your eyes are going to start glazing over. You got to bring it to a, a real world example. And, and then always say, we're not trying to just gut this thing. We get it. We're, we want to have controlled healthcare costs too, but let's just make it work better. And I think it's a very reasonable ask. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right. Thank, thank you all so much um, for those really great um, information that you all shared with us. We've had some questions from our students, and so um, I'll start with that now. Um, so first, this will be directed towards Brian. Um, do we have data to demonstrate the economic impact this has had on providers, like hospital payer mix shifting away from Medicare, or private practice financial instability? Um, they're also curious about what kinds of providers this is most affecting. So what, from, what, from what we're seeing, we're seeing a shift away from uh, providers in rural and underserved communities because there's less of an incentive for them to, um, to, to go into those, those areas because they're not able to, to receive adequate payment for services. And we're seeing a shift towards hospitals in more big healthcare systems um, because of this. And that's why um, we need to incentivize Congress to have a um, a, a, a stable payment up, update system in order for all practices to be able to sustain and be viable. 
And, you know, I can lean on Sandy and Jason to see if they had any further thoughts on that. No, I think you have it exactly right. Um, you know, it's, it's physicians need to have their practices adequately supported in order to deliver care to patients. And when they're not getting that kind of financial support, they need, they find that they need to go places where they can get it, which is, you know, the, the organizations that have the deeper pockets. So yeah. it's a problem. Okay. Uh, this next question is directed towards you, Sandy. Um, what data do we have on differences in quality between telehealth and in-person appointments? How can we ensure that providers incentivized to take more telehealth visits will not result in worse quality patient care? Uh, the, the research that's been done so far has not shown any diminishment in quality when services are provided by a telehealth. In, in fact, there are some advantages for certain kinds of patients when they receive a telehealth visit because if they have uh, symptoms that are sporadic, for example, the, the physician can see those symptoms when they happen with neurologic conditions, for example. Patients who have conditions that are affected by what they eat, diabetes or other similar cardiovascular conditions, physicians can actually see what's in their patient's kitchen. A lot of patients, after they get to a physician's office, if they have certain functional limitations or they're just nervous, whatever, by the time they get to the office, they're actually in worse shape than if you had seen them in their home environment. And so it also allows them to be seen where the patient is most comfortable. And that, that can be an advantage to quality of care. So it's not that all care should be provided, by a telehealth. Um, we don't want to go back to those days of April 2020 when that's how everything had to be done. But um, when it's mixed in, when you have a mix of in-person care and maybe you do the follow-up visit by a telehealth, um, you do some remote measurements through equipment that you can send home with patients, um, it, it can work very well as a hybrid model and care could be as good as in-person care and in some cases perhaps even better. Thank you so much. All right, our next question is directed towards Jason. Um, so how strict should the qualifying requirements be? Would there be any room for exceptions? This student also writes that they've had problems where a medication gets approved under one marketplace insurance, but can't get another because they have much stricter requirements. The idea would be to have um a streamlined process. This is for, the, for this particular bill, Medicare Advantage. CMS have to come up with a, a pro process that works for all plans, so you don't have to deal with, um, you know, what's Edna's plan, what's Humana's rules for this. And I mean, there's going to be some differences between plans and what's covered or not. But as far as what's covered, if it's a covered service, a streamlined process, so it should apply for every every process, every coverage, every service that's covered should have the same process that you go through. And it should be transparent, what's required, what's not. Um, if it's something that's regularly approved, 95% of the time it gets approved anyway. And uh, why can't you do what's called Gold Card Texas passed a law where they allow, if it's going to be approved anyway, give them a gold, a gold card, so to speak, and they just jump right ahead. And, and, and don't waste our, everyone's time going through this. But there needs to be a stand, some standardization and some more real-time decision-making. And maybe there are some things where there should be an appropriate check. Uh, but not for everything. And, and you want your physicians thinking about what's best clinically treatment that's out there, not about the hassle of who they're going to have to call on the Aetna hotline to get this resolved. Thank you. All right. Our next question is directed to Brian. Um, what are your thoughts on CMS accepting less and less of the RUC's recommended payment values in the last Medicare physician fee schedule? CMS accepted roughly only 75% of the recommendations. And, 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 I, and I hesitate to comment extensively on, on the RUC process. I know we have staff that's extremely um, focused on that area and maybe we can you know, uh, push that question to maybe Sherry Smith. But you know, over time, you know, the, the, the RUC valuation system, it's, it's, it, you know, the requirements to um, develop codes has that the burden has, has become higher. Um, you know, with the with the use with the increases in technology, with so many codes that are in the system, 
you know, usually, you know, in, in my opinion, there's usually overlap with other codes and there's usually codes that already exist that may be used in order to um, identify the, the, the system or identify the service that's already being handled. But again, um, we can probably direct that question to um, our RUC staff who will have a better take on, on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one's directed towards Sandy. Uh, what steps can students take to help with the in-person requirement aspect of the mental health or telehealth legislation? Um, actually, I'm going to kick this to Jason because okay. there is legislation <laughs> pending that would remove that requirement and that's what has to happen because the, the requirement comes from a law that Congress passed. So we need help from students to advocate passage of the law that would remove that requirement. And I'll just jump in. You know, uh, not last year, but the year before there was a bill that passed that extended health coverage for mental health care, a good thing. But at the last minute, uh, and this is how things work on the Hill, some committee staff are talking to someone, they just, that's just they put in this six months, this is put in this requirement that they have to come in person. Very arbitrary, wasn't vetted, and they just put it in there. And we argue that, why? Like one of, one of the um, sort of lines of telehealth is that mental health services have been one of the most highly utilized services via telehealth. It's a, it's a preferred modality among many. Uh, and, and it's working. And just like we fight for mental health parity, why is it that mental health is treated differently than so-called physical health? And why is it not the same? This is another example. So everything else, all the other services don't have this in person. Why are we singling out mental health? Like once again, uh, the parity issue is cropping up and it's arbitrary. And so we're just saying it's not needed. And, and, and it, it's something you just, we were hoping that it just gets removed. And we're getting bipartisan support for this. Thank you. Um, so I just believe this would be directed towards Brian. Um, if we move toward a quality reimbursement structure, what is to prevent physicians from not treating high-risk patients? In other words, how do we ensure all patients are receiving care regardless of their risk stratification status? Yeah, and, and that's, and that's the, the, the very point of quality care, right? We want to make sure that these conversations that we're having, that any reform payment system will allow for the appropriate um, payment um, to care for patients who are sicker or have um, social determinants of health. So um, it's the priority of any payment system that we, that we put forth to make sure that um, there are parameters or safeguards in place to make sure that all patients are being cared for. And that's the point of having these conversations with the House of Medicine to make sure that all um, physician um, societies and physician services are part of these discussions to make sure that, you know, everybody's interests are being met and we don't put forth a system that um, prioritizes um, certain patients over others. Um, for Jason, would the prior authorization bill be something that would try to streamline the prior authorization process for all insurance companies or just Medicare? So right now, it would just apply to Medicare and particularly Medicare Advantage plans with the hope that it would drive the private plans to follow suit. Now, one of the reasons is it's one of those trying to be practical. What can you actually take and get into law? And if you go after the private plan, it's what's called a RISA, and, and it's a much bigger lift. And, and, and historically, bills that, that tinker with the RISA don't go very far. They get introduced to good press release. They don't make it to the end result of final law. And so we're trying to be pragmatic and follow the lead of some of our champions who think that if you focus on Medicare Advantage, that's a good start. It's a good space and you can go from there. And so it's, it's a, this is one of those issues that multi-prong, multi-steps. If, if we get this win, it becomes law and it's still having problems with the private plans, then we'll be right back with bills on that. Okay. I can add a little bit to that. Um, you know, it's the same health insurance companies. So the, the same health insurance companies are contracting to provide Medicare Advantage insurance as are providing commercial insurance to employers and to other groups. So Medicare has an opportunity to lead here. If you get those companies approaching prior authorization in a better way in their Medicare Advantage products, hopefully there will be a follow-on process with their other products. 
And then uh, to one of the last questions to Jason, um, can you expand more on the admin administrative burden of prior authorization on physicians? Yeah, so the example I gave about just to, I had the horrible rash, not a true story, but I had a horrible rash and the physician has to navigate with the Aetna's staff, you know, um, it could be a non-physician they're talking to and they got to have talk, okay, yeah, I, need it. I know it's just one medication, but he has a unique rash, you know, it goes over the nose really bad and this one works better around that. And yes, it costs more, but it was what works. And they got to explain that. And then um, there's 41 of these a week. The other one could be a cancer care. I, I, I'm recommending this just course of treatment because of this person's unique uh, cancer situation. And, 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 and then one other one's a cardiac issue. And 41 of these a week, and we, we've done the time, time study where it's, it takes two days just consumed by just going through um, these, just these hoops, you know, and most of the time they're going to get approved. And so that's time that could be spent uh, making your practice work better. It could be it may spent working more on treatment, hiring more clinical staff, say you're hiring administrative staff to just comply because you can't not do it because the other result is, if it takes too long, a lot of patients just give it up. I'll, I mean, yeah, I'll just give up on that rash. And I'll just live with it for a week and embarrass my kids and it'll go away. But I probably should have taken it earlier. So you don't want your patients to walk away or not get treated. So you've got to follow it through. And no matter how long it takes, how frustrating it is. And, it, and it's to no good end from the physician perspective. So it's, why are we wasting our time on this? That's kind of what, that's the source of the frustration in it. But you got to have the staff to do it or, or you get denied. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of, kind of in that same vein, um, is this prior authorization bill, is this just for common medications like insulin, or would this also work for specialty meds like monoclonal antibodies? My understanding is that, that prior authorization could be on can anything as small as like a little rash cream to mm -hmm. something more significant. And, uh, you know, and there might be some cases where it's a very high cost medication and, and you want a check on that. But if, if there was a more streamlined process, look, we have AI now and data that can, can crunch numbers and do things more efficiently. Why can't we focus more? Maybe some of that should be focused and let's have the prioritization on those high cost, um, highly variable outcome treatments and not the more routine stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, not seeing any more questions. I, I want to thank you all again for, you know, uh, taking time out of your day to kind of meet with us and kind of explain these policy issues in a way that'll help us prepare for our, our meetings tomorrow. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Yes. yes. Thank you all.